Good morning, everybody. Good morning. There we go. Uh, welcome to West Harlem. Um, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing uh, our first panel, who are an incredible group of folks working on the front lines in community, in preservation, and in development uh, in our city and making great waves. So without further ado, I think we'll kick it off. Um, we have up first, uh, joining our panel, Debbie Hirschman. Uh, Debbie uh, began her tenure as executive director at the uh, Center at West Park in May of last year, but has had a long and storied career um, as CEO of the JCC in Manhattan, uh, growing it into the formidable juggernaut that it is today. Uh, and we have Samuel Turvey, Chairperson of Rethink NYC, uh, a not-for-profit uh, who, who took on that role in 2020 and who is one of our uh, great, great minds in rethinking the possibilities for our city. Uh, Liz Waitakis, uh, a good friend of mine, the executive director of Dakumomo, uh, the nation's foremost organization advocating for the preservation of modern architecture, um, and also uh, a co-chair of Housing, Zoning, and Land Use at Community Board 9. And uh, Dean Martha Gutman will be joining us as a panelist. Uh, and I think we've heard her introduction, but we're very, very lucky to have her and her years of experience uptown uh, on the panel today. <clears throat> so our panel is about the current state and challenges and campaigns and perspectives in preservation. And I want to take a moment to step back and think about you know, where we are with this work in the past three years, uh, you know, with the changing of city administrations, the past five years having gone through a world-defining pandemic, uh, and the past 10 years, you know, as sort of New York has both hit highs and lows and, and is kind of finding its footing now. So I guess the first question that I will pose Actually, I'll let, I'll let our panelists introduce their work a little bit first um, for a minute or two, just so that you know, everyone can understand what it is that you do in your day-to-day -day role. I feel like I know that, but I think it helps to have your background. So if we can start with Ms. Hirschman. Put on. Uh, thank you for having the center at West Park and giving me the opportunity to work here today but I'm really here representing a group of people who have taken on this challenge since 2002. So, uh, and I'm the new kid on the block. I am not new when it comes to imagining all that is possible and understanding that even in the most difficult times, vision and values are paramount. So in 1990, when I had the privilege of being asked with eight volunteers to create a community center on the corner somewhere on the Upper West Side. I was told by Leonard Stern, I was told by many, it's never been done before, it won't be done again, and certainly not with the economics of 1990. Fast forward to 2001 and a $95 million building, 137,000 square foot space became the anchor for a community, all diverse communities on the Upper West Side. Fast forward to last May, when being given the privilege to partner with many of you who preceded me, I'm not a preservationist by nature, I am a preservationist when understanding that the history and values of spaces have to be protected in order for humanity and our hearts and souls to exist. So I'll talk more about the center at West Park and why it, just like the JCC, becomes an anchor for community, diversity, inclusivity, and is positioned, and Martha, we're thrilled to be up here because one of the great statements of Mark Ruffalo who took this on as his battle to preserve this space said, there's the public downtown, there is BAM in Brooklyn, and uptown, beyond Harlem, all need a similar anchor, and that's the center at West Park. So thank you for the privilege of being here. 
All right, can we pass it over to Mr. Turvey? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thanks to the hosts for inviting me, and uh, thanks to City College. It's an absolute privilege to be on this historic campus and this historic institution. R Rethink New York City um, uh, is the advocacy arm of Rethink Studio, which was founded by Jim Venturi. And we have been projecting and ever developing a regional thought process for New York. And at its simplest, we believe that the connectivity that the subways gave to the outer boroughs when they integrated them should happen with the outlying counties in this area and that that would innervate our job market, our access to housing, so many things that it would be terrific. That's the theoretical. As it winds up, uh, it intersects with the location of the, what most of you consider the architectural crime of the century, and that's Penn Station and the demolition of the original Penn Station. That was the architectural crime of last century. We now have proposals for Penn Station by the state and by the railroads, Amtrak, MTA, uh, and New Jersey Transit that are the architectural crime and transit crimes of this century. And it's important to see that. E everything we, we should have learned when Penn Station was demolished, we not only seem to have forgotten, but we're doubling down on and making a lot of mistakes. So what we came to learn early on in learning of the governors and Empire State Development Corporation's desires to spit shine Penn Station they're going to pay for this by demolishing most of the surrounding neighborhood and allowing the Vornado Realty Trust to create a campus in their own vision. And we'll get into it a little later, and I do have a handout, which I encourage some of you to get during the breaks, that shows you there's actually a tremendous amount of architecture in that neighborhood that is still standing, and it saddens all of us to see what may happen to it. And most assuredly, I don't think any of us wanted to see the Hotel Pennsylvania become tennis courts. I'll close by saying I'm not just Rethink New York City. I'm part of an Empire Station Coalition, which is a group of 15 civic groups, think tanks, um, neighborhood associations. Some of my colleagues are here, partners in solving the architectural crime of this century. Leila Logisico from Community Board 5 and a journalist has been at this longer and more feverishly than I have. George Calderaro from the 29th Street Neighborhood Association is back there. But we really feel and have proposals where you could streamline and modernize transit at Penn Station with no need to demolish the surrounding neighborhood. By doing the kind of integration of the region that we talk about, we feel we would decompress some of the pressures on real estate in Manhattan. You'll never eliminate them entirely. But we could stop cannibalizing our built environment and try to make sane decisions about what goes on there. And uh, we'll answer more questions about it as we go on. But it's a uh, it's been quite a journey, and I thank my colleagues for all their assistance. And I think I see Andrew Berman someplace, who happens to be one of my heroes, so I'm glad to see him in person for once. Thank you. Thanks. I have one, and it works. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Liz Wytakis. I'm the executive director of this funny little organization called Doco Momo. Um, and I'm also a resident of West Harlem. I'm sort of wearing two hats today. Um, so in addition, to, I am a preservationist. I run a, the national organization of Docomomo, which stands for the documentation and conservation of the modern movement. So um, all the stuff that preservationists, um, at least in the past, typically did not like. Um, I, I went to preservation school at Pratt. Um, Eric Allison, some of you may remember Eric, um, had started that program. And my professors remembered uh, the buildings that were torn down to build the buildings that I love. I mean, I live in a historic district. I actually live in walking distance. I live about a block and a half on Convent Avenue. Um, City College is, is uh, uh, my backyard. And when I look out, I see, you know, this fantastic campus, but I also see this building, the North Academic, Camp, um, North Academic Center, um, designed by John Carl Warnicke. Um, he also, he's built a lot of modern buildings. He built the Capitol in uh, Hawaii. Um, 
So my tastes are a little eclectic, um, but uh, yeah, it's um, it's always uh, it's never boring at Jokomomo. We've landmarked things in New York, like uh, Philip Johnson's AT and T building. Trust me, I never thought I was going to be the advocate for postmodernism. Um, and for the last two years, we've been working with um, our colleagues across the city on trying to save 60 Wall Street. So um, there is a brochure. I don't have it in front of me, but we partnered with HDC on uh, landmarks of the future. And on the cover um, is 60 Wall Street, which is just a, um, a very charming, um, if you can call 1989 charming, uh, maybe for my generation, um, but it's just a, a, a remarkable postmodern interior space. And then um, I think my other hat just I want to mention is um, I am co-chair of Housing, Land, Use, and Zoning for Community Board 9. Um, I love um, being here at City College and seeing all of my, uh, my friends and colleagues from the Community Board. And I, I just wanted to see how many people here are from West Harlem or Harlem. How many of us are here? That's great. Thank you so much uh, for coming. We do have a lot of historic districts um, in West Harlem, but we have a huge swath um, that is not landmarked. And I think that is um, part of what uh, UN has been um, her most recent task of trying to West, uh, landmark West Harlem. Um, so that would be from 135 on the south, 155 on the north, from Amsterdam on the west side, all the way over to Riverside. There are UN, there's no, there's nothing designated within that swath. I think there might be two individual um, designations. Um, so I know, I see we have homeowners in that, um, in that swath. So I'm really uh, excited for the panel today. Hopefully we'll, um, we'll talk about landmarks in New York, but also our, uh, our little community here in Harlem. It is already a state historic um, district. It is not uh, a city landmark. That's what we're working on. Thanks, Ewan. So hi, everybody. <laughs> nice to talk to you, speak with you again. And I have to say, I think I'm a busy person. And I hear what my colleagues on this panel, all the organizations they're involved in. And I wonder where you find the time to sleep. So thank you all for, uh, for your service. So I. I too am a resident of this neighborhood. I walk. I, I live in the neighborhood. I walk to work. Uh, I live on a, in a building that Andrew wrote the description of. So uh, I'm very um, live and own in that live that in a building that I own. So I'm a homeowner as well as uh, as well as a member of this August um, August community. This August institution. So I'm I'm here uh, in this in this seat to try to give you a brief overview of the work of the J. MBC Center, the J. Max Bond Center for the Urban Futures. The director, Sean Rickenbacker, uh, is uh, a sense regret. <coughs> excuse me, sense regrets. He's unable to make it this morning. And, and so the Bond Center, uh, under Professor Rickenbacker's able leadership, has been uh, working to rebuild ties to the Harlem community as an advocate for preservation and community assistance that were severed under a previous director, I think, unfortunately. And uh, I support Professor Rickenbacker's intention to, um, to rebuild them. And so we're, we are, he is, and we are working with community, uh, community folks, particularly in, in the Bronx and in northern Manhattan, to, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, um, to restart ties uh, with uh, local agencies, local nonprofits, and the like, who need community assistance in restoration, uh, in restoration and, and the like. Uh, uh, this, is, it, this is a vision for the future. It isn't something that we're in place now. There are two people running the Bond Center, Professor Rickenbacker and the assistant, whom I convinced the provost to let me hire for him, uh, um, a person named Lizzie McWilly, who comes, who's a native New Yorker, but had work in Texas working for a similar kind of organization. And so that's the hope and that's the aspiration that the doors of the center, which open onto, uh, which the center is located uh, in the, on the first floor of the Spitzer School of Architecture and the doors open directly uh, into the, into the public realm. Uh, in order to facilitate that kind of that kind of connection, and and so uh, what I'm hoping, what I would like to say to you is, please stay tuned for more news uh, as we 
as we rejigger and rethink and re reimagine the Bond Center to be a community design center of service to members of this community. Okay, so that's Thank it. you very much, everyone. So uh, I'm going to, I'm, so the, the remainder of the panel, I'm gonna throw some questions out there. The panel is gonna focus on what are we facing today in this city um, and, and where does preservation fit amongst all of the competing city, state, and community objectives. Um, and I'm going to start, uh, I'm, I'm just gonna mention we are in a city right now that is seeing some of the most pro-development stances taken um, by many elected officials in a long time. We have massive citywide text amendments moving through the ULERP process. Uh, and you know we have big generational infrastructure challenges that are being confronted and hopefully funded and undertaken. And so we're at a moment in time where there's a lot going on. And so what does it look like from the perspectives of, of the academy, of advocates, of think tanks and visionaries? What, what campaigns are you seeing and what that are exciting or interesting and, and what, are the, what are the obstacles or opportunities that they're facing in this moment? Go ahead. I think your framing is, is really helpful because I think that opportunities are many. The real estate community clearly has a control and we're facing it, right, this, the, this landmark building on the corner of 86 in Amsterdam, right? What happens during COVID is that the Presbytery and West Park Church make a deal with a developer for $33.4 million to produce a demolished landmark. In order to produce a demolished landmark, you have to reflect hardship. There are criteria. I'm not going to go into those. But remember, a very important piece of this is this happens during COVID, right? And, and when do, we don't look at the implications of COVID for all of our work and what it means to come out of COVID and how you come out of it fastest and best, it puts our work in jeopardy. So though there was a small group of people who were taking on this battle where you know that you have alchemy funding, all of the litigation, all of the presentations to landmarks, all of the PR that they can afford. And you have a, a small group of people who undertook to create with the church a center for the arts, understanding that 501c3s have access to funds, and that's very important, that a church won't or a synagogue won't. So one, it identifies partnerships are critical building collaborative partnerships across all of us in the room, since some of us have never met each other, and we're all taking on similar battles, that's our first job. We have no excuse, we can't blame the real estate community unless we all connect and find that project which we feel can support our work and others. Next thing becomes that if we wanna argue, we have to have economic stability by which we argue. Hardships can be presented. I worked with another landmark exterior building. Unlike the church, they've maintained their synagogue. However, they could have gone for a hardship. They've just struggled for decades and they didn't let scaffolding be up for 20 years. They didn't not take care of their building. They didn't forecast that there were gonna to need to be other sources of revenue. So then to go reward, because a developer comes along and says, look, there is hardship. There is no question. Maintaining a building like West Park on 86 in Amsterdam is a costly endeavor. But it is wrong to have presented that there are mice and rats and there are structural difficulties. But why does that happen? It happens because we don't engage enough people to come into our spaces to see them. So our challenges, I don't believe, aren't that there aren't people out there to support and to give visibility. It's finding the right people. And no question, 
that Matt Damon and Mark Ruffalo and Wendell Pierce and Stephen Adley Gerges and Tony Kushner and John Leguizamo, who have joined this battle, brought the visibility. Debbie Hirschman and the great board of the Center of West Park would not have shifted the tide and the understanding if it weren't for those people. They did it because they do want to preserve the heart, soul, and culture of New York. So switching to the other thing is we have to know our arguments. So the real estate community is fundamental to the economics of our city. So too is arts and culture. And if we don't forecast, as Mark and others are doing, that they couldn't have come to New York were it not for community-based art centers. When we work with artists who can afford $30 an hour or $90 an hour, and that all accumulates, we now have earned revenues of over $300,000. That didn't exist during COVID, when the arguments were made that there's no renters. Well, of course there's no renters, it's COVID. There are no renters in commercial buildings. <laughs> But perception becomes much harder to change than reality. Our job is to unify our vision and values with an economic model that can function beyond getting through the battle and to build community and coalitions that allow this future to build on the history. Absent those three components, and I've had the privilege, and that's what the JCC did, and that's what we're doing now, to say you have to integrate program, community, financial resources, and a diversified portfolio of economics to take on the battles of real estate and everything else you're facing. So thank you. So uh, Sam, you know a lot about battles of real estate and, and, and what you're facing when it comes to Penn Station and the surrounding area. What, 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 is, the, what is your view from the ground or from you know, the distance and the perspective that the state sometimes appears not to have? And, 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 and what has the interface been like in this current challenging campaign to do Penn Station right? Well, I would say it has changed with the passage of time, and the passage of time probably has helped us a little bit in a couple of ways. The Penn Station plan was being incubated, but largely launched just as COVID was taking wing and Andrew Cuomo became the most popular governor in the country, and there were Cuomo sexuals. And we, uh, no, no surprise, uh, he is a bully. And he was ready to steamroll that whole neighborhood and hand the keys to Bornado and tell us all to drop dead. And then he got a little handy and met his own demise. Um, but uh, since then, the real estate market has also uh, largely collapsed. And Bornado has said, we can't do any ground up development right now, although they sure speed dialed reducing the Hotel Pennsylvania to dust. But what I'd say, you know, we have this development interim period. I, I think they're not even telling you how afraid they are of what's, what's going on in the development community. But um, they are not going away. And while the governor decoupled the plan to demolish the neighborhood to fund the station, she has left it in place, and that is driving a lot of us uh, to, to really question what's going on there. She seems to be frozen in absolute indecision, and we're not sure what it's going to take to get her out of that. But I would say in dealing with the development community, I think this is a problem that we all have and, and that I would mention. I, I do want to applaud quickly your getting those movie people involved. People are always saying to Layla and I and George, where's your Jackie Kennedy? And my response to that is, you know, Jackie Kennedy was 33 years old and widowed to this matinee idol, president of the United States, and looks like and dressed like Audrey Hepburn. There are not many of her around. You know, you, you need six people to, and you're still not caught up with her. So, so that's not gonna happen, but we need to continue a sustained public awareness campaign. And in terms of an emerging headwind I would bring up, I am increasingly seeing the press, print media, and there's not enough of it. I mean, we really miss the Village Voice. Uh, the Times doesn't have as many people stacked against Metro as they used to, but some of them are getting so tired that they've decided, let's try a new tack 
and suggest that the reason we don't have housing in New York is because of environmentalists and preservationists and the, and the second generation of those Looney Tunes who stopped Westway. We have to fight that vociferously. We don't win that much, I hate to say it. We don't win nearly enough. And we are preserving the fabric of this city that employers want, that Hollywood wants, we, we are protecting them from them, themselves. They are, the, they are ki the goose that's killing the whatever. That New Yorkers want. Um, <laughs> exactly. so, so Liz, you, know, you have two hats that give you a unique perspective. You advocate for saving many of these buildings. And then you also, you know, in your role as on the community board, look to creating housing and to figuring out the city's arcane zoning and how to make that happen while preserving a community. So what are you seeing from your perches on those in terms of changing tides in the city, on the ground, in the community, in the advocacy world? It's very frustrating. <laughs> um, there's no, there, I mean, in that article in the New York Times, I don't know how many people saw that. I think it was in December um, saying that historic districts were um, the problem in that. I think the writer said he wanted to see his grandmother's house uh, demolished on the Upper West Side and that he would be happy to see that happen. And I just don't know what planet these people are on. Like, you know, this is... You know, New York, people come to New York because of its diversity. We come to it for the diversity of architecture, people, food, culture. I mean, we don't want things that all look the same. And that's a lot of what we're getting. I mean, so if I put on my Docomomo hat, um, it makes me think about 60 Wall Street and uh, really just trying to dumb down um, architecture and make it... Um, uh, palatable and very muted shades and um, that's not New York that's not why we come here we come because we want to see art deco and we want to see you know Italianate we want to see postmodernism like right up next to against each other that's what I want to see and I can tell you from advocating for 60 Wall Street that's what young people want to see they want places for uh, Instagram, do their selfies and all of that. I mean, that's why, that's the excitement. That is the new excitement of what uh, New York should be. I think 60 Wall, um, one of the reasons, so Landmarks Preservation Commission uh, reviewed 60 Wall Street on the exterior, um, and that is a very long story, but um, because it is not a landmark. Um, and they did not allow the developer to alter the exterior in a significant way. We agreed with the alterations on the exterior. And then for the interior, which is a privately owned public space, it's a POPs. So that is why um, the city could regulate that interior. Um, their response to us was that landmarks did not want to get in the way of economic development. So just let it settle in, like that landmarks and economic development are at odds with each other. How did, I don't know. It was, um, I think it was a lot for the coalition that was advocating 460 Wall to take in um, of what exactly is going on and who is influencing. I mean, this is not new about what's influencing landmarks, um, but to have it written in a letter to all of us was um, challenging. I also think about um, here in our community, and I'll, I'll wrap with this. Um, uh, so talking about the West Harlem Historic District, I sort of outlaid the, the, that area. And um, we had a, a meeting with the city about, um, it was before the pandemic, we talked about soft sites um, and, and areas within that that we knew were significant and that there was development pressure. And um, Landmark said, well, if you know, you have a little, a little area that you know a developer wants to demolish and that those are historic, let us know. And so we did, and they did nothing. So this is the corner of Riverside Drive and 142nd Street. We have um, an intact row of, there's probably, maybe 14 row houses, um, turn of the century. I have photographs of them putting in Riverside Drive and the houses. I lived in one and um, the city did nothing. They said, 
um, you know, they're altered. Some of them are altered. The ones they've demolished were not altered. Um, and that there are other examples um, from those designers and we're not going to do anything. And so now we have a developer who um, made a proposal um, before the buildings came down to get an upzoning to put a 17-story tower on the corner of Riverside Drive and 142nd Street. Community Board 9 said no. We said no. Mark Levine even said no. And they tore it down anyway. So people come up to me and say, oh, you know, what are they going to do there? I heard they're going to put up a 17-story tower. And I just want to say good luck with that. There's no appetite in this community for that. Um, but I do worry, um, knowing what's happening with the city, that um, it's going to happen anyway. But before, before, raise your hand here if you're from Manhattan or live in Manhattan. Okay, so we're, we're a little blinkered. Um, I, I include myself in that. In that we know this borough and we love it. I assume we love it. But... Uh, Manhattan has seven to nine percent of this city's land, um, and I don't know. So there is a lot of talk about real estate, about housing, about economics, about the housing shortage that we're in. Forty-six percent of the residentially zoned land in this city, which is all outside of Manhattan, is zoned for essentially single-family housing with front yards, rear yards, and side yards. Isn't it amazing that DCP and developers never, never say, well, you know, they have to, they have to address it. You know, we're, we're arguing over six to six FAR, should we lift the 12 FAR cap, which would only benefit extremely large developers. No one's talking about lifting the FAR from 0.25 to one in 46% of the city's land and allowing someone to build a duplex <laughs> or an ADU. And we'll see what the city of Yes Housing comes up with. But Dean Gutman, one just, I wanted to hear your perspective from the Academy's point of view, you know, where are we in preservation and its challenges and its opportunities? Sure, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So I just wanted to answer, first off that, that um, comment that you made about uh, changing the FAR in the outer boroughs. I think Emily Badger from the New York Times gave the Lewis Mumford lecture last year, and she made two points about the way in which we can begin to solve the housing crisis in the city. One is to adjust parking requirements, and the other is to permit ADUs. And if this were to happen, there would be a transformation in the land, in the real estate economics of the outer boroughs. I would also uh, add to that, and I think Emily would agree with me, uh, adding uh, uh, surface level rapid transit by either light rail or through buses. So there's a lot, and there's a lot of interest in that in, in, uh, among, among folks. Um, but to come back to uh, the question about where we stand with regard to preservation and, and from the perspective of the academy, I just would like to pick up on the comment about collaboration and to say that there's uh, come to us, you know, ask to work with us. Because here at Spitzer, I think here at Columbia, at Pratt, wherever, there's enormous interest in the student body and among the design faculty who at Spitzer are not necessarily preservationists, but architects, landscape architects and urban designers who are thinking about community-based preservation as part of their project, as part of their mentality, as part of what they uh, want to achieve in instilling an ethos for, and it, in students, and I say instilling, the students come to school with that in mind. Uh, um, and part of this has to do with the climate crisis, that the thought of destruction uh, as a method or clearance as a method, aside from all of the historic wrongs we know that it came with, including on this campus, and just as a side, we would have a really hard time here trying to designate this building as a landmark. <laughs> Just, that would be a, a big, a, a hard sell, although I can understand although why, we, why, we, why we might want to. But, right. but in, and we, maybe we can talk about that. But just to say, there is that interest. And there are, I would say, every semester, or certainly every year, in the advanced studios at Spitzer, both undergrad and grad, studios that, that are based on the principle of adaptive reuse and repurposing, studios that start with thinking about the landscape, the urban landscape as it is, and what can be done to work with buildings as they stand, 
And by the way, our architecture school is an example of adaptive reuse because our building was built as the Cohen Library in the 1950s, and it was re changed and readapted and adapted and used over the years. So that 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 interest is there, and I just would offer one other. I think pretty powerful example of what collaboration can uh, can offer. So Professor Nandini Bakshi uh, uh, was quite interested in the um, uh, uh, district health center in the South Bronx uh, that uh, you took the renovation, the preservation and renovation of that New Deal building uh, um, as a subject for investigation within her studios, working with community partners. Uh, um, that fast, and in part, this had to do with the way in which that building was used as a health center uh, in conjunction with a young, the Young Lords uh, um, health programs of the 19, 1960s, uh, 70s, and, and the like. Uh, and just fast forward to say that that project is, she's now designing the renovation of that building in her studios. It's been in her own private practice. It's been advanced as a project. And I'm really really thrilled to say it started. That investigation started here. It started in a design studio, in an architecture studio, with an architect who shares the ethos that uh, I think informs this, this group. So there's lots to have, there's, there, the doors are open. Ms. Hirschman, you wanna walk through a door? I, I do, I wanna walk through uh, the door about landmarks and real estate and influencing the process because that is the story, right, of this landmark building. History is clear, Joseph Papp began there. In God's love we deliver. The first gay marriages go back to civil rights being brought here. You can't find more history and why this building is landmark. And yet, until this tide turns last May, Everyone said to me when I walked into the story, Debbie, you're ready to lose, right? I said, look, I am, because the values and the vision you've all supported for decades deserves to lose for. However, when people say, look, it's going to be a luxury building that's going to earn $255 million to a developer who's paying $33 million, that it's gonna affect the housing crisis. And that's being put forth. And then someone who works in government said to me, because any time you increase it, it affects those who can't afford luxury housing. And it's like, and when you just spoke, Barry, your point is amazing. Because when we look back to what has preserved families and neighborhoods, it is multi-homes where families, the grandparent and the parent and others live in that building. And knowing the demands on families today and childcare and trying to go to school and all the things, just imagine if we frame what happens to those people who can't afford Manhattan, can't afford a lot of feeding their families. You transform it with your model. But we have to get those messages out because, and landmark preservation has to understand that we can affect the problems that we're all talking about in our city and not put real estate as the only driver. Why did the Economic Development Corps give the JCC money and an IDA bond? We're in the 90s, right? And we're talking about this community center because we said to them, if you want to stop families from moving to New Jersey or Westchester, you need to build indoor spaces just like you have Central Park. It's the same thing with spaces like churches and, and places that have to be repurposed. But we have to do it to show it's an economic drive as well. So actually, let's, if we can dig in on that a little bit more. You know, Liz, you brought up that LPC said, it, you know, it, it kind of views itself in opposition to economic development. Um, and we, I think a lot of us in the room would know of a house of worship or another building that is struggling to maintain its historic structure and the economics they haven't figured out yet. So, you know, what, what needs to change in the way we talk about preservation and economic development, and what needs to change in the way we think and act about it 
um, you know, like, like Ms. Hirschman said about, you know, bringing economic models that work with preservation. It's a good question, and I, I think I come back to collaboration. I think it's a, I think the city needs, the, the agencies need to talk to each other. I think they need to talk to community boards. Um, they need to tell us what's going on. Um, we were just uh, mentioning, I don't know, um, St. Luke's is on the corner of 141 uh, and Convent Avenue. Um, I look at it every day. We actually have two um, uh, buildings uh, on that corner that are abandoned. Um, we just had uh, a building, another building on Convent Avenue in a historic district, 451 Convent Avenue, um, come down, demolition by neglect. Um, I was talking to Frampton earlier, I don't know where Frampton's run off to, and he was telling me that there are a couple of issues in the Dorrance Brooks historic district. So if you're a Harlemite, you know that's um, one of our newest historic districts down, down the hill. Um, yeah, I mean, how do we avoid this? I think we need more events like this. We need to collaborate, and we need to, we need the city to um, to work with communities to work and and build the infrastructure in. Um, you know, living here, I would love to see St. Luke's turn into something, something. Um, you know, more than just a, you know, an empty, an empty shell of, uh, you know, a former um, place of worship. It's around the corner from uh, Hamilton Grange. I mean, why can't we repurpose this? Why, you know, it's, it's also, there's a National Park Service little plot of land there. Like, why can't we all get together and, and, and build the, the neighborhood anchor um, with that um, piece of parcel? Uh, and Mr. Turvey, you've got one of the maybe most citywide or regional wide views on this. And so you're probably getting a very front row center view on the challenges and tensions or imagined forced tensions between preservation, between economic development and between, you know, infrastructure renewal. Um, I don't think anyone I don't think anyone here is overjoyed with the state of public transit in New York, although I will tell you it is way better than anywhere else. So what, you know, what, what do you see, what, what do you think can be done to remove this kind of dichotomy or false opposition between economic development and preservation, but also between regional infrastructure transformation and preservation? Well, I, I think what we're doing today, we need to multiply and do far more often and develop contacts in the press and keep getting this in, in, in front of people. And I think you're right to say, while we all complain about transit in New York, it's actually a tremendous asset. It's just as important as our deep water port, and yet for some reason, uh, we treat it with disdain, with, with brief shining moments where someone like Richard Ravitch or Andy Byford treats it better. And, and we've somehow got to start calling that out and, and, and integrating that thinking into where we're going. In terms of the regional perspective, what I would say is I look at the region the way I look at the whole city. I was born on Staten Island. I lived across the street from or next to two Stanford White Houses. They were smaller, um, but I've always loved landmarks, but I love modern buildings too. But from, from the regional perspective, uh, I, how many of you have been to Patterson, New Jersey? Well, I highly recommend the film Patterson to you. And if you put something in place like through running that we're talking about, Jamaica, Queens, Sunnyside, Queens, Patterson, New Jersey, Newark, Passaic, they become more relevant. There are beautiful spaces there. The Great Falls in Patterson is absolutely sensational. I think we have to keep fighting back. The, we're fighting back a lot of big lies these days. We got to keep fighting back the big lie I mentioned earlier that we're the problem. Uh, we are not the problem. And, and in the back of my, um, home where I talk about the buildings in the Penn Station area that they'd like to tear down by some of the most famous architects ever, I compare it to the Bryant Park neighborhood where on the south side of Bryant Park you have some mm. trophy landmark worthy buildings. You have two very large buildings uh, up on the north uh, west corner, one by the Bank of America. I forget who the other one's by. It's by one of the tech companies. Salesforce. But we, I think, collectively love Bryant Park. We love that neighborhood. We love that diversity. That's what the model should be. So when you go to Penn Station, 
Uh, the whole region feels that way, but that park isn't just loved by city residents, but you go to Penn Station, what they wanted to do, it, it is sort of the opposite of anything logical. And, you know, I am going to keep picking on the Bornado Realty Trust. They own two one-story buildings on 33rd and 8th and 33rd and 7th. They didn't need to get permission to knock down the whole neighborhood and, and recast it in its own image. That's not what New York City does. We don't have corporate campuses like that. They could have built uh, plenty tall buildings on those one-story sites and organically seen how the neighborhood grows and works around it. They certainly could work with the community board on other things. But to leave those sites dormant, to say there's not going to be any ground-up development, and by the way, before you get any thoughts about trying to yet again declare the Hotel Pennsylvania a landmark, we're going to tear it down and propose to put tennis courts up. You can't have a bigger tenure than that. I have not seen major media take them to task for that. That is disgusting. It is a disgrace that they did that, and, and the governor should be really embarrassed by that. Well, that is my one voice, but I do speak from a regional perspective. I'm, I'm going to ask, I don't know how to ask this question, so I'm going to try, but you've brought up some questions or themes about large corporate development versus organic infill, smaller scale development which is what you would need to do to incrementally add housing in the 46% of the land in this city that's zoned for a single house with yards. And in, I want to say, January of 2020, the Department of City Planning held a briefing where it reviewed the past decade's worth of data on housing and, and mobility. And, and one of the things that stuck with me is in terms of which regions were generating housing and jobs, New York had generated hundreds of thousands of new housing units and hundreds of thousands of jobs, and it had eh, kind of kept pace with itself. Long Island had generated some jobs and no housing. Westchester, some jobs, no housing. Southeast Connecticut, some jobs, no housing. The area that was bearing the burden and meeting it was northern New Jersey, which had added hundreds of thousands of units of new housing and, no, and you know, not nearly as many jobs. And so how can we re you know the, the media is covering much of this in terms of progress and housing and development versus preservation and nimbyism how can we remove the focus on these major projects like vornado that to be honest don't add much to our regional economy they're drops in the bucket but you know it's like planting a single tree in a field but if you re-sow the entire field with things and you, you know, grow some shrubbery, that's a hell of a lot better for the ecology and the, and the ecosystem. How, how can you have that conversation with people to think about, instead of Vornado making a couple billion dollars, a couple thousand contractors each making a million dollars? Like, how, how, can, how can we shift that narrative? See, I don't think it's the narrative, it's who's controlling the media, right? And, and we sort of have to go back there. I can tell you that this, when saying about Alchemy's controls, they have Belkin, they have, uh, I forgot the firm, they can literally get CBS, ABC, any of these places to where they want them to write the story they want to write. So unless we figure out who are the media people, who are going to take this on in the same way that these people are controlling it, and it costs a significant amount of money. When we were potentially facing the vote that got announced that was going to take place on October 31st to determine whether it was going to be torn down or not, and we had to hire, quote, crisis PR, because we don't have the funds to hire PR people, it was $10,000. Well, how many entities in this room can afford PR on a monthly basis? It just isn't there. So unless we figure out who are the media people, and just what you said about the Times, right? Or unless we find the same kind of people as the arts and culture people who have certainly taken on for us, as well as the neighborhood people who now know the real story, Unless we do that at the grassroots and then find our right media people, because the city's also controlling media. I, I, I concur on the media point. And just to come to a point we haven't discussed, why do you have outlying counties 
fighting changes in zoning or even outlining boroughs, and it frequently has to do with race and fear. And I think what I can give, I, I think what we need to do, I do not have the solution to those problems, but I do say you can find communities and areas where things have worked and ask why they have worked. So I'll give you an example. Northern New Jersey, which you mentioned, actually is probably more racially diverse, I, I think, probably, than Nassau or Suffolk County, and probably even Westchester County. Montclair, New Jersey, is now called the Upper West Side of the suburbs. Uh, Montclair, New Jersey, was actually struggling for a while with race and other issues, but when the Midtown Direct opened, which started taking trains directly into Penn Station instead of into Hoboken, there was a rebirth uh, in Montclair, and it is now one of the more successfully diverse communities you will find in the communities like Maplewood, New Jersey. Now, all of them have their tensions and problems, but those are communities that at a minimum are trying, are frequently succeeding, and other people are saying, stay the hell out of here. We have to find ways to replicate that. Sometimes uh, you need to, 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 to lead with d different kind of housing models to try to, to, to break, the, break, break, break the, the tie. I do think the governor was trying to move housing out into the suburban areas. And you know, I mean, my father-in-law in his retirement years lived in South Orange, right on the railroad tracks. You'd say, who would wanna live there? It was actually a very nice building. And the railroads didn't really bother anybody. There's boatloads of space where things can happen it will take a lot to break those fear factors down, and we know there are people who manipulate those fears, but there are communities that are succeeding at this. We need to look at them and, and try like hell to replicate what they, their success is. The irony is because there's no Vornado that can make that much money from a lot of small-scale development as opposed to one big-scale development. No, there was no major ammunition or artillery backing up the governor on that push, and so you know she ran straight into the pitchforks and torches of, of the suburbs. But um, I just want to let everyone know we have 15 minutes left in the panel. Um, and I guess I want to ask two questions. I wanted to ask both of them. I don't think we can get to them in 15 minutes. One is, is there a piece of technology that you think is going to be a big change in the world of preservation? Um, and you know, everyone's talking about AI, but it could be new materials um, in buildings that make it easier to restore, preserve, uh, you know, CNC, stone cutting. It could be anything, whatever you think of. And the other is, if you could walk away from this conference with one productive piece of collaboration that you would want to do Monday morning, what would it be? Anyone can start. I know, I wanted to ask both of them, but. I, I'm gonna not, I'm gonna pass on your first one. <laughs> my, my, fam, my family would say technology, my mother, I would not <laughs> go there, but I'm sure there are others who can do that. I had written down your center, the Spitzer Center, right when you spoke. I believe that I've met people, and they all know that, and my board members will say, you will hear from her before Monday morning. <laughs> it is what it takes, meaning I do know that, and, and I'll give the, the example that I haven't done yet, but people would say, you know, we've been fighting morning, noon, and night. Andrew Berman, who's here, who I've heard about and know what he's done, he, it's very important that I sit with him. So we have an obligation to leave here to act which is the same thing we say to our communities. There has to be a call to action, and if each of us don't hold ourselves responsible as to what we've learned today, who we're picking up the phone to, even if it's just one. Also, you have all mentioned opportunities for fundraising. I just want to put that out. No one may have heard that, but I heard it. So also think about what might be possible from what you've heard from a fundraising perspective. Just, we, we're, we're looking forward to that phone call. Okay. <laughs> so just two, two, com two comments, actually, uh, in answer to both, to both questions, I think. First off, broadly speaking, with regard to materials, uh, we are in the midst of a climate crisis. We're seeing daffodils bloom in the beginning of March, right? Preservation and the movement to 
and the environment, the people who are advocating for important solutions on climate change are, go hand in hand. And I think that argument has to be made, made as strongly and profoundly and loudly as possible. Architecture firms now design buildings from cradle to grave. Uh, with cradle and grave programs, figuring out how materials can be used when the building eventually comes down. So there's not an antagonism there. There's an opportunity. That's an opportunity for collaboration. And there is huge, huge work, enormous work going on in material science in relationship to embodied carbon. That's another big uh, issue for us uh, at Spitzer with regard to some of the faculty on our, um, on our, uh, on our, um, uh, uh, some of the faculty who are, who are working and teaching um, at, and researching at, 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 at Spitzer and at City College. With regard to collaboration, um, St. Luke's was taught in a design studio here, and Professor Bakhti led that studio. And there was a, a, it, one of the, the hiccups that happened in the, in the um, execution of that studio was not what, what to do with the church, uh, because churches, I believe, can be repurposed as the community centers that we all need for whatever purposes, for the arts, for community meetings, for daycare centers. They're, they're, they're capacious buildings. I personally do not believe they should be transformed into housing. I've seen examples of that, and I, I don't think they're particularly uh, successful. Uh, but the big question was what to do with the open space, what to do with the land. And there were advocates for more parks, uh, for keeping the land open, which this part of the city desperately needs more open space, as well as advocates for affordable housing. And those conflicts were irreconcilable in that studio. I don't believe they have to be. But, um, but that, that was where that conversation got, uh, the answers kind of got flummoxed uh, um, in, with regard to community engagement. So. So I think, I think there's the small scale, like what do we do with these buildings? How do we deal with open space at the level of a city block, right? Not at the level of a grand plan or a regional plan like Sam is speaking about, but uh, um, although those are also important considerations, and then there are the bigger alliances that can be built along a lot around causes that may have seemed antithetical to one another, but in fact are answering or are are offering that are two sides of the same coin. The embodied carbon, the climate crisis was ha this is, it is the principal issue of our time, I believe. Yeah, and I think that'll be two phone calls on Monday morning, because I think we should revisit St. Luke's, I know, for the community board and the community in general here, um, trying to find a solution there. I, I don't know if the, um, uh, the congregation that owns St. Luke's is here today. I know that they're, they have another historic church in Harlem and um, uh, both churches, you know, dwindling congregations and dwindling money and they couldn't keep both of them open. So that is the reason why uh, St. Luke's is on the market to be sold. And um, they're actually good uh, collaborators, I think, with the community board. They keep us up to date. I know uh, uh, some of you may know Angel Aon, who I believe is on the HDC board of directors. Um, he has been working with them. And um, yeah, so maybe if we can come back to that studio and find a solution. That's really where my mind goes is not on, you know, although Docomomo US, my, the national organization, um, Every year we have a theme. Uh, this year's theme, I know it's super sexy. It's suburban corporate campuses. Um, <laughs> this is my life. Um, and it's not necessarily to say that all of these suburban corporate campuses feel free to con you know, conjugate what, what that looks like in your mind. Um, not, you know, we're not saying they're all historic, um, but they're getting older. And I think it goes back to the climate crisis of what do we, what do we want to do with those and getting communities to just think, you know, a lot of what I do at Jokomomo is getting the entire country to think about what what to do with these. Um, but I think for all of us here today, to your question, it, it's probably about what is the one one building, one one piece that we can all take away. I'm going to ask I'll, Sam to. I, I'll take five seconds before Q and A. What I'd like to do Monday, I would like you to pick up this in the other room. My email address is there. Please, if you're up for it get on our mailing list. Uh, we have weekend editions, we have ruminations. We, I, I feel like a media source, but I, I, I wanna make sure we all stay connected. And then I'll just close saying, 
Robert Kennedy, who I absolutely adore, his speech in South Africa about uh, ripples of hope is, is what this is all about. And there are many ripples here. We just have to keep building the, 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 that outgoing tide of, of, of what we do well. And, and I'm very proud to be here. And we'll have a great Q&A. And that's the former senator, Robert Kennedy. Um, <laughs> So we have q and I, I don't even think about that other guy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do the gentleman in the red scarf, and then Anita. Uh, anyone else with a question? Gen or woman in the gray uh, shirt, and then let's see where we are with time. Hello, my name is Juan Blanco. My background is in architecture, historic preservation, and urbanism. And I currently work with an energy firm in, in, uh, in Houston that has adapted NASA technology for here on Earth. I say that because I made a proposal for the Bedford Union Armory that wasn't acted upon that would have created, apart from a micro energy station, which is absolutely necessary if one thinks back about the power outage in 2003 and, and, and Hurricane Sandy, but it's also something that is an intrinsic part of combining historic preservation with uh, dealing with climate change. And it would have generated for that community $10 million a year in revenue. I'd like to say that in passing because I think stations like that could be located throughout many facilities in New York that would save them. And the pres and project that I did for the Bedford Union Armory was also a preservation do, proposal. Do you have but a I have a question. Um, yes. And it seems to me that it would be very useful to enable historic sites like these churches, which are very endangered, to have a, a, a source of revenue implicit in them continuing to exist. And that might be the ability to sell their air rights throughout New York City on a 10-year period. That would provide them with an energy, in, uh, an income that is renewable, and it also you know, saves the property and makes the property valuable in that sense. Land right, air, or air rights bank, we've heard a lot about this over the decades. Anyone got a thought? The challenge with the air rights are the way you sell your air rights and the contiguous nature that it has to be. So the, the way that your statement would work, and it is something that we all have to look at, is to expand to whom air rights could be sold while protecting the neighborhood. So, but currently, most of those spaces can't meet the criteria by it's which a question of changing it. the criteria and well, yeah, fighting for that. Well, that's, that's consistent. Yeah. That's true for all the things we've said, which is what becomes the criteria by which landmark preservation is going to make their decisions, right? And how climate control and all these other factors have to start playing in beyond the real estate issue or housing. Yeah. yeah. Anita? Um, yes, I have two. They're coming with a mic. No, thank you. Uh, we have, uh, we're, Montserrat and I are here uh, representing uh, 501 West 143rd Street, which is very close. It's a beautiful corner building. Uh, you, I, some of you in the neighborhood might have seen it before. Uh, it has all these beautiful details. And if you look at the corner, if you do a 360, all the other buildings have lost those details. And we are in the situation where we really need to fix our building, but we can't afford it because we're, you know, mostly mixed income, low income, middle income, uh, and we can't even afford the fixes. Scaffolding has gone up. We don't know how many years it's going to be up because we just don't have the funds and we don't know. Uh, we're looking for help to, uh, form partnerships and uh, collaborations to fund this. So my general question, my bigger question is how uh, smaller uh, owners can uh, participate in community benefits, uh, meaning, you know, uh, preserving architecture. And my, the second uh, part that, thing that I wanted to mention is RKO theater. Mm -hmm. RKO might be slightly niche for us, but um... Uh, anyone, the challenges for not just, you know, a church, but like a low-income cooperative in maintaining and preserving their building, how do we address those concerns from homeowners who might not have the big, you know, deep resources, to, but who want to preserve their structures? You can answer that question. You can answer the housing question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I... I, I'm going to go to history of spaces and where people grew up and where they live because, in fact, going backwards as well as looking at the businesses and the banks in one's neighborhoods,
becomes places to look more than throwing a benefit because it mm -hmm. costs money to throw a benefit and everybody likes to throw benefits looking very specifically as well as at family foundations that are geared toward the principles that you're talking about I believe will be a more effective way to go about neighborhoods being able to address the kind of issues that you're talking about and I'm sure Dean Goodman will appreciate so the building in question is an HDFC which I know Manhattan Valley and West Harlem both have a ton of um, yes in the gray shirt with the red um, name tag easy to contact people. You see them on television all the time. Most of them will go and say, hi, I cover Queens, I cover Harlem, I cover this. And you just send them an email. And if they're interested, and if you keep bombarding them on the same email or on the same topic, they're going to respond. That's one. And the other one is I'm complaining about the air rights. Because on 70, 70th Street, is uh, the synagogue so the rights in that building is so tall it just screws up the entire neighborhood on 103rd street the same thing and the air rises we got were like from all over so and i know that they, they were taken to court and they won at the lower level and then at the second level the appellate went and allowed that place to stay up there and did they ever come to you with how much air rights or that when the community board, when they approve a building, don't they come with the whole? The area? air rights are usually as of right. I'll just add, I can answer that question. Um, so, you know, the zoning would have to allow the height, which on the Upper West Side, I believe it did. And then the, you know, the, that case was interesting because of the gerrymandering of the lot I think you're talking about. I'm going to take two more questions if I can. Woman in pink and woman in um, gray in the corner there. Um, I do want to encourage everybody, though, to um, talk to folks. I'm going to be beelining to you <laughs> with experience in media. Um, but uh, yes, let's go right ahead. Yes, you're up next, and then, you, and then you're after the woman in the pink. OK. I was thinking about the churches. Why can't the churches actually rent these spaces out? They can have a residual income by renting out these spaces for whatever reason. You know, that would be a good idea. Like, they could become landlords and rent these spaces out instead of just leaving them vacant. They could become, universities can use the properties, you know. So, I mean, landlords make a lot of money. Churches can become a, a landlord business and hope land, you know, and rent these spaces out and make a residual income, you know, and that, I think that's a good idea. I don't know why they don't think about that. All these churches could make a business out of becoming landlords. Anyone want to take that, the thought? I'll just tell you that architecturally, uh, some of them are not very efficient from a rental standpoint. They'd have to be converted to some style use. I'm not trying to throw cold water on your question. Sometimes they can be, but I, I, you know, my native borough, St. Peter's Church on Staten Island, which is right near the ferry, you'll see it has a real tall tower and really, really, really high ceilings. And um, I, I, you know, maybe you could, I, I don't know what you could rent it out for. Um, so it's, it's a great idea. And then some of, many of them have uh, small graveyards next to them. And so it's, it's, it's easier said than done, I think. Catering places, caterers, you know. Um, I'm going to. Take the woman there. I, yeah, I think there's a lot also to have that conversation after because it is a big topic. Yes. Hi, I'm I'm located in the smallest point of the city in New York, Manhattan, and um, it's very frustrating when there's development that's going to be happening and they ask for community input, but when the project comes to fruition, they don't accept the community. They do this lottery system. So I think there should be more conversation about actually making the AMI reflect everybody, including the people that work for the city, in it. Shouldn't be 130, it should be based on the income of the people who you ask what their opinion should be when the project gets fulfilled 
and then you tell them they can live there. Issues with AMI, affordability to the real community that lives in that neighborhood. And Liz, I know we talk about this every month. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, 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 it's interesting. I, I actually, I won a housing lottery, which I just, I mean, just like you have to win a lottery to have a place to like go to sleep at night is like a really wrong concept. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, the, the income bans are bizarre and, um, you know, when they, you have affordable housing, right? Those of us in the community where we talk about affordable housing, it's always with the air quotes. Um, because there's so little of it that's actually, you know, for people with it, that are within the, the AMI bands of that, that current neighborhood. Yeah, no. And then there are all these super high bands of like people can make, you know, $170,000 a year and, and get an apartment in affordable housing. It's, it's, um, um, it's nonsensical. So our time is up. I want to thank all of our amazing panelists. Can they get a round of applause? I, I am also going to take a point of personal privilege to the question about, I think it was 200 Amsterdam, was that you were talking about that project where the judge was overturned? I will note that many preservation nonprofits, you all know who you are in this room, get invited to submit panelists to the panels that review judges to see if they're highly qualified. This is an excellent reason to send me panelists, and you know because I'm the one who sends you the emails asking for them. All right, thank you again to everyone. This was a great panel. Chain, exchange numbers, exchange emails, and let the conversation continue.